It's milk and biscuits time. Aladdin's mother brought the china dish when he took the jewels out of the two purses in which he had kept them and placed them in order according to his fancy. But the brightness and luster they emitted in the daytime and the variety of the colors so dazzled the eyes both of mother and son that they were astonished beyond measure. Aladdin's mother, emboldened by the sight of these rich jewels, and fearful lest her son should be guilty of greater extravagance, complied with his request and promised to go early in the next morning to the palace of the Sultan. Aladdin rose before daybreak, awakened his mother, pressing her to go to the Sultan's palace and to get admittance, if possible, before the Grand Vizier, the other viziers, and the great officers of state went in to take their seats in the divan, where the Sultan always attended in person. Aladdin's mother took the china dish, in which they had put the jewels the day before, wrapped it in two fine napkins, and set forward for the Sultan's palace. When she came to the gates, the Grand Vizier, the other viziers, and most distinguished lords of the court were just gone in. But notwithstanding the crowd of people was great, she got into the divan, a spacious hall, the entrance into which was very magnificent. She placed herself just before the Sultan, Grand Vizier, and the great lords, who sat in council on his right and left hand. Several causes were called, according to their order, pleaded and adjudged, until the time the divan generally broke up, when the sultan, rising, returned to his apartment, attended by the grand vizier. The other viziers and ministers of state then retired, as also did all those whose business had called them thither. Aladdin's mother, seeing the sultan retire, and all the people depart, judged rightly that he would not sit again that day, and resolved to go home. And on her arrival said, with much simplicity, son, I have seen the Sultan and am very well persuaded. He has seen me too, for I placed myself just before him. But he was so much taken up with those who attended on all sides of him that I pitied him and wondered at his patience. At last I believe he was heartily tired, for he rose up suddenly and would not hear a great many who were ready prepared to speak to him, but went away, at which I was well pleased, for indeed I began to lose all patience, and was extremely fatigued with staying so long. But there is no harm done. I will go again tomorrow. Perhaps the Sultan may not be so busy. The next morning she repaired to the Sultan's palace with the present, as early as the day before. But when she came there, she found the gates of the divan shut. She went six times afterward on the days appointed, placed herself always directly before the sultan, but with as little success as the first morning. On the sixth day, however, after the divan was broken up, when the sultan returned to his own apartment, he said to his grand vizier, I have for some time observed a certain woman who attends constantly every day that I give audience with something wrapped up in a napkin. She always stands up from the beginning to the breaking up of audience and affects to place herself just before me. If this woman comes to our next audience, do not fail to call her, that I may hear what she has to say. The Grand Vizier made answer by lowering his hand and then lifting it up above his head, signifying his willingness to lose it if he failed. On the next audience day, when Aladdin's mother went to the divan and placed herself in front of the Sultan as usual, the Grand Vizier immediately called the chief of the mace bearers and, pointing to her, bade him bring her before the Sultan. The old woman at once followed the mace bearer, and when she reached the Sultan, bowed her head down to the carpet which covered the platform of the throne and remained in that posture till he bade her rise, which she had no sooner done than he said to her, Good woman, I have observed you to stand many days, from the beginning to the rising of the divan, 
what business brings you here? After these words, Aladdin's mother prostrated herself a second time, and, when she arose, said, Monarch of monarchs, I beg of you to pardon the boldness of my petition, and to assure me of your pardon and forgiveness. Well, replied the Sultan, I will forgive you. Be it what it may, and no hurt shall come to you. Speak boldly. When Aladdin's mother had taken all these precautions for fear of the Sultan's anger, she told him faithfully the errand on which her son had sent her, and the event which led to his making so bold a request in spite of all her remonstrances. The Sultan hearkened to this discourse without showing the least anger, but before he gave her any answer, asked her what she had brought tied up in the napkin. She took the china dish, which she had set down at the foot of the throne, untied it, and presented it to the Sultan. The Sultan's amazement and surprise were inexpressible when he saw so many large, beautiful, and valuable jewels collected in the dish. He remained for some time lost in admiration. At last, when he had recovered himself, he received the present from Aladdin's mother's hand, saying how rich, how beautiful. After he had admired and handled the jewels one after another, he turned to his grand vizier and, showing him the dish, said, Behold, admire, wonder, and confess that your eyes never beheld jewels so rich and beautiful before. The vizier was charmed. Well, continued the sultan, what sayest thou to such a present? Is it not worthy of the princess, my daughter? And ought I not to bestow her on one who values her at so great a price? I cannot but own, replied the grand vizier, that the present is worthy of the princess. But I beg of your majesty to grant me three months before you come to a final resolution. I hope before that time my son, whom you have regarded with your favor, will be able to make a nobler present than this Aladdin, who is an entire stranger to your majesty. The Sultan granted his request, and he said to the old woman, Good woman, go home, and tell your son that I agree to the proposal you have made me. But I cannot marry the princess, my daughter, for three months. At the expiration of that time come again. Aladdin's mother returned home much more gratified than she had expected, and told her son with much joy the condescending answer she had received from the Sultan's own mouth, and that she was to come to the Divan again that day three months. Aladdin thought himself the most happy of all men at hearing this news, and thanked his mother for the pains she had taken in the affair, the good success of which was of so great importance to his peace that he counted every day, week, and even hour as it passed. When two of the three months were passed, his mother one evening, having no oil in the house, went out to buy some and found a general rejoicing and you're at the houses dressed with foliage, silks, and carpeting, and everyone striving to show their joy according to their ability. The streets were crowded with officers in habits of ceremony, mounted on horses richly caparisoned, each attended by a great many footmen. Aladdin's mother asked the oil merchant, what was the meaning of all this preparation of public festivity? Whence came you, good woman, said he, that you don't know that the Grand Vizier's son is to marry the Princess Budir al-Badur, the Sultan's daughter. Tonight she will presently return from the bath, and these officers whom you see are to assist at the cavalcade to the palace where the ceremony is to be solemnized. Aladdin's mother, on hearing this news, ran home very quickly. Child, cried she, you are undone. The Sultan's fine promise will come to naught. This night the Grand Vizier's son is to marry the Princess Budir al -Bodur. At this account Aladdin was thunderstruck, and he bethought himself of the lamp, and of the genie who had promised to obey him. And without indulging in idle words against the sultan, the vizier, or his son, 
he determined, if possible, to prevent the marriage. When Aladdin had got into his chamber, he took the lamp, rubbed it in the same place as before, when immediately the genie appeared and said to him, What wouldst thou have? I am ready to obey thee as thy slave. I and the other slaves of the lamp. Hear me, said Aladdin. Thou hast hitherto obeyed me, but now I am about to impose on thee a harder task. The Sultan's daughter, who has promised me as my bride, is this night married to the son of the Grand Vizier. Bring them both hither to me. Immediately they retire to their bedchamber. Master replied the genie, I obey you. Aladdin supped with his mother, as was their wont, and then went to his own apartment and sat up to await the return of the genie, according to his commands. In the meantime, the festivities in honor of the princess's marriage were conducted in the sultan's palace with great magnificence. The ceremonies were at last brought to a conclusion as the princess and the son of the vizier retired to the bedchamber prepared for them. No sooner had they entered it and dismissed their attendants then the genie, the faithful slave of the lamp, to the great amazement and alarm of the bride and bridegroom, took up the bed and, by an agency invisible to them, transported it in an instant into Aladdin's chamber, where he set it down. Remove the bridegroom, said Aladdin to the genie, and keep him a prisoner till tomorrow dawn, and then return with him here. On Aladdin being left alone with the princess, he endeavored to assuage her fears and explain to her the treachery practiced upon him by the sultan, her father. He then laid himself down beside her, putting a drawn scimitar between them, to show that he was determined to secure her safety and to treat her with the utmost possible respect. At break of day, the genie appeared at the appointed hour, bringing back the bridegroom whom, by breathing upon, he had left motionless and entranced at the door of Aladdin's chamber during the night, and, at Aladdin's command, transported the couch with the bride and bridegroom on it, by the same invisible agency, into the palace of the Sultan. At the instant that the genie had set down the couch with the bride and bridegroom in their own chamber, the Sultan came to the door to offer his good wishes to his daughter.